just for the recording sake, I'm Rahul. I have been teaching Android for a few years now. I work at Facebook and I've been teaching through CodePath and now at Stanford. And I'm really excited to kind of be here and teach uh, an hour and a half or two hours at Make School. Thank you for indulging me. Um, just really helpful. I haven't worked too much with Make School, so it's, it's really helpful for me to get a sense of what people are focused on and you know where you're coming from. Okay, so I want to talk more about what we're here for, which is Android. Before we dive into this, any questions about what we've talked about so far or the structure? So what is Android? I think most of you already know this. Android is a mobile operating system maintained by Google. The cool thing about Android, as opposed to a platform like iOS, is that it's open source, which means that the code is freely accessible. If you really wanted to, you could um, look at all the source code and actually fork it. So you could clone that Android OS source code, modify it, and make whatever you want with it. That's like one of the really powerful things about Android is that it's extensible. The operating system for Android is based on Linux. So if you have a background in kind of Unix or Linux development, then a lot of that knowledge carry over if you're dealing with the Android OS. Um, what we're here for is app development on Android, right? So we're not really going to be too concerned about the internals of Android, but what we are concerned about is writing apps. And you have two choices for writing apps in Android, either Java or Kotlin. So Java, all of you probably know this already, Java's a language which has been around for decades now, right? Um, whereas Kotlin is much newer. So Kotlin came out in the last maybe five or six years. And in 2017, that's when Google officially announced that Kotlin would be first class supported in Android, meaning that for all newer apps, um, Kotlin is the recommended path um, for development rather than Java. Android is a huge, huge ecosystem with 2 billion MAUs. MAU stands for monthly active user. So this makes it the largest operating system in the world. And that's actually one of the reasons that I got attracted to Android, right? If you wanna be able to reach huge numbers of people, really the only way to do that is with Android. So in addition to having so many people who use Android, there's also a thriving ecosystem, developer ecosystem around Android. So the Google Play Store, which is equivalent to the App Store on Android, um, that contains almost 3 million apps. So that, that gives you a sense of, you know, there's so much, there's so much functionality that developers have added into the platform and a lot of value that they're adding into the platform. Uh, okay, and if you look back at the timeline, um, like I mentioned, Android is the most popular operating system in the world, but interestingly, it came out a year after iOS. Um, so if you are interested in this kind of stuff, there's a lot of articles and even some books written about the early days of smartphones. So 2007, that's when iOS came out. So Steve Jobs famously went on stage and revealed the first version of the iPhone. So Apple is really unique in that they control both the hardware and software, right? And so in 07, that's when Steve Jobs announced the first version of iPhone, and it was a huge success. So the interesting thing is that Android is a startup that I believe it was founded in 2003 by Andy Rubin, um, and it was acquired by Google in 2005. So clearly Google had some knowledge about, they wanted to build out uh, this smartphone operating system even prior to iOS being released. So they've been working on it for a few years. But the story is that when the Android team watched Steve Jobs' keynote in 2007, they were blown away by how good the iPhone was. And essentially what happened is they had to go back to the drawing board and redo a lot of how Android worked in order to compete with iPhone. And that's why Android 1.0 was only released in 2008, so about a year later. Um, and like there are some really big changes that happened at that point. So iPhone was one of the first devices or maybe the first device which had a full touch screen, but there was no physical keyboard on the phone. And Android wasn't designed that way. So that in that one year time frame, that's where Android really went back to the drawing board and said, how can we design an OS where we can assume that all the uh, keyboard inputs and all the other inputs are software rather than hardware. So 08 is when Android 1.0 was released. And every year since then, there's been a major release. 2014 is notable because that's when Android 5.0 was released, uh, otherwise known as Lollipop. And I'll talk more about that the next slide. But then we continue up until today, 2019, so last year, that's when Android 10 was released. So if you buy a brand new Android phone, it's most likely it's going to be running Android 10. Um, so 2014 is a year that I'm going to call out because that's when Android 5.0 was introduced. So if you look back at the history from 2008 till, till now, every single year, Android has been changing rapidly uh, in terms of 
introducing new APIs, new functionality, um, new recommendations on how to develop apps. So 2014 was Android 5.0, and that was where really where I consider Android entering into the modern day. So 5.0 introduced material, material design, and that's something which Google finally provided guidance on color schemes, iconography, animations, on how you develop Android apps. So prior to 2014, if you looked at the general design of most Android apps, it was a wild west where people would be dealing with colors or navigation or icons in very different ways. And that really led to a broken experience where I would open up one app and my mental model of how to navigate that app would be totally different than another app. And so finally in 2014, Google came down with really prescriptive guidelines on how you design apps. <clears throat> and that's, that's really what led to um, kind of Android being more aesthetically pleasing as, as it is today. The other major improvement is something called ART, which is Android runtime system, which is a vastly improved runtime system compared to what was there before. Um, and it's improved particularly with garbage collection and something called AOT compilation, ahead of time compilation. The other thing that's been happening is that recently there have been flagship phones introduced in Android. So you have something like the, uh, the Samsung S series. So it started out with like S3, I believe, or S4. And every year Samsung has come out with a more powerful version of the S series. So now it's S10. And then also in 2017, I believe, or 2016, the Google Pixel started coming out. And the idea here is that Google, this is a hardware phone manufactured by Google. So it really um, embodies what is Android, vanilla Android look like. So usually if you buy a phone, an Android phone like from Samsung or HTC, they'll put in their own software on top of Android because Android is open source, right? But Google Pixel is vanilla Android and it's a flagship phone that's gained a lot of attention. And so both of these combined, so Android 5.0 coming out and also the introduction of more powerful phones, this has led to Android actually competing with iPhone more recently. So prior to this, I would say that most people who had the disposable income would have picked an iPhone over an Android just because the cohesion of the hardware and software on iPhone just worked so much better. Um, and this also led to some interesting artifacts where as a company, I know that most of my audience who has disposable income, they're going to be running an iPhone. And so if I'm looking to maximize my bottom line revenue, my profit, I'm going to put a lot more resources onto iPhone rather than Android. And what that meant is my iPhone app would almost always be better than my Android app. And now as a consumer, if I had the choice to pick between an iPhone or an Android, I'm probably going to pick the iPhone because I know that the apps in general on iPhone are better. So it kind of led to this virtuous cycle where iPhone kept getting better and better. And so that's what I'm trying to say here is that starting in the last maybe two or three years, finally, I think Android has gotten to a point where they have really good phones, really good apps, really good design standards, and it's really competing with iPhone. So actually, I'm curious. Um, I would like to use the uh, the like polling feature or like the interaction feature on Zoom. Can you give me a thumbs up if you use an iPhone in your day to day life? So let me see how this works. Yeah. Okay. So people are giving thumbs up. So everyone knows about that feature. Yeah. So in Zoom, in the bottom, you have this ability to give a thumbs up. So it looks like we have maybe half <clears throat> half people on iPhone. I'm assuming does that mean that the other folks are on Android. So that's actually pretty good. So most of my friends actually are only do, using iOS. So it's always good to, to see some people who have, who have Android. Um, any questions so far? And if you do have questions as we go, go through, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, otherwise, just use the chat. And I'll be checking the chat on my other monitor occasionally. One of the other really cool things about Android is that it's a totally open ecosystem, right? And we talked about that earlier. So not only do you have Android developers who make mobile apps, and that's a, the majority of Android developers probably just make mobile apps, but you also have a thriving ecosystem with Android TV, Android Auto, Wear OS. Um, and also other companies will also take Android and use it for their own purposes. And this is actually very close to my heart because Facebook Portal is the product I work on at Facebook. Um, so Facebook portal is basically a hardware video calling device. And the, what we've done 
is we have a whole team of firmware engineers who have taken Android open source, forked it, modified it so we can run on our operating system. And then you have a whole team of app developers, people like me, who build custom apps for our operating system. And so you can kind of think of it like Android development, but it has some unique quirks because we have a custom operating system. So literally the reason I have my job is because I'm an Android developer and Facebook portal is Android based. Um, and so you have the ability to transfer your knowledge that way. Like there's no way if you're an iOS developer, for example, there's no way a company like Facebook or another company could fork iOS and build out their own modified version of iOS. That just wouldn't be possible. Right? So Android has this flexibility of being able to, to not only do Android development, but also development in adjacent areas like Android TV or Facebook portal. So really at the end of the day, why should you care about Android development? Even if you don't decide to be a full-time Android developer, I really strongly believe that having a familiarity with Android that will allow you to compare and contrast the approaches of different platforms. So a lot of you mentioned that you are iOS focused, right? And that's great. I think um, there's a, obviously not only a need for Android develop developers, but also a need for iOS developers. But I think the value in being able to learn Android is that when you think about things like, okay, how do I make a network request? How do I display a list of items? If you can talk about how you display a list of items on iOS and Android and think about what are the pros and cons of each approach, that will make you a better developer, right? The mark of seniority for developers is having an opinion about what architecture or what approach is good, right? And the way you develop that opinion is by being able to look at um, how different platforms are, are approaching these, these, these technical problems. The other thing about Android, which I really appreciate, is that the development tools are very free or are very cheap or totally free. Um, so I've, I have a few apps that are published in the Play Store. And I think the price might have changed, but when I became a developer a, a while ago, I, I paid like $25 or $30. And that was a one-time fee, and, and now I'm a developer for life. Whereas com compare that to Apple, to become an Apple developer, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the price is like $100 a year. So you have to pay $100 to submit an app, and then every year you want to keep that app in the app store, you have to pay another $100. So it really becomes quite expensive. The other thing about Apple is that there's a human, an actual person who will review your app, and they have the power to reject your app if it's not deemed to be good enough. And so um, I have an app on the Apple store as well, and that was something I did with a team. So that was an interesting experience to publish that. But I also tried to do like a quick side project on Apple. I published it, and I got rejected by the person who reviewed the app saying that it's a lack of functionality. That was kind of upsetting because I paid like, you know, whatever, $90 or $100 to become a developer and then my app got rejected. Um, but with Android, you don't have that problem because the, there's no human to review your app. It's a kind of an automated review process. So you submit your APK, which is the actual Android app. Um, you submit it, it goes through some automated review and a day or two later, it'll be out there for anyone in the world to download from the Play Store. And then finally, I hope I convinced you in the previous slide that there's a ton of job opportunities, a ton of really high paying job opportunities in Android um, because you have a huge growing ecosystem around Android and also in adjacent areas like Android TV, Android Watch, or like, sorry, Android Wear um, and things like Portal. And so I think not only are there, is there a huge hunger for Android developers now, but there's a lot more expected in the future. Okay, so um, how to develop Android apps. I talked about this already a little bit. There are two options, either Java or Kotlin. Both languages, Java and Kotlin, they both run on the JVM. JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine. So what that means is that Java and Kotlin are interoperable. But like I mentioned, Kotlin is a much more modern and less verbose language than Java. And so that's what I recommend for all students to learn as they go into the world of Android. And you'll see what I mean by it being less verbose when we actually get to the coding part. So I have a link here. I'll share my slides after. I have a link here to the Kotlin documentation so you can learn more about it. The documentation for Kotlin is amazing, um, which things like that make it really fun and easy to learn the language when you have good documentation, good examples, things like that. So Kotlin is a statically typed language and it interoperates with Java. So the, re the reason it's really important that it interop interoperates with Java is because when Google announced Kotlin in 2017 or 2016, um, there needed to be a way 
to migrate all the apps out there to using Kotlin, right? So if you said that, okay, Kotlin is not going to interoperate with Java and you only um, want all new apps to be developed in Kotlin, that's, that's actually, there's no way you would gain adoption that way, right? Because you have all like literally millions of apps out there that are already written in Java. You need to allow all those millions of apps to slowly migrate over to Kotlin, right? Not, these apps can't just overnight flip a switch and turn everything into Kotlin. And so the fact that Kotlin interoperates with Java, what that means is you could have maybe 20 or 30 different classes in your application, which are written in Java. And then one day you decide, okay, I want to migrate over to Kotlin. Then you can write one new class in Kotlin and that will interoperate with all the other 20 classes that you already have in your app. That's a really powerful thing about Kotlin, that Kotlin and Java work together. So here's a really quick code snippet. Um, again, I mean, you could have a whole class dedicated to Kotlin. There's just no time to talk about that here. So I'm literally going to show you four lines of code and assume that you have <laughs> some background in Kotlin. And I'll, I'll walk you through it when we go through the coding. But this is all I think we'll have time for. And yeah, now I see William's asking, will you share the slides with us? I, I'll definitely do that. Um, I'll share the link at the end. Um, and if there's something in particular you have a question about, just feel free to stop me and I'm happy to answer. So in Java, I think probably a lot of you are familiar with Java already. Um, here's how you declare a string. You say string first is equal to Joe, last equal to Smith. If you want to modify that Smith string, you can say last plus equals S. And then in the bottom line, I have a string text, which is concatenating Mr. plus the last name. So compare that to Kotlin. The first line is saying val first. So the first thing you'll notice is that you don't declare the type of the variable first, you declare it either as a val or a var. So just by hearing the name val and var, can someone tell me like what's the difference between a val and a var? So looking at this code example, right, we have val first and it's a string and it's equal to Joe. And then you have var, which is like variable last is equal to Smith and we're modifying last. So based on that code snippet, can someone give me a guess of why would I use val sometimes and then use var another time like well, why would I use one over the other is val something that can be or val is something that's immutable yes exactly I think Valerie I think you're the one who said that. I think that's exactly right so val as you can see from this example once I've set the value of val first to be Joe at this point val cannot first that the variable first cannot change I can no longer modify Joe Whereas last is, a, is declared as a var, which means I am able to modify that variable and I, I'm appending s onto Smith. That's, that's exactly right. Um, and we'll come across that again as we do the coding. And that last line I wanna show you here, I say val text is equal to Mr. And then what I'm doing here is I'm doing string interpolation, which is you can kind of think of it as the same as string concatenation, um, but Colin has a nicer way of doing this. So we're saying Mr. and then we're using dollar sign what that's saying is replace dollar sign last with the actual uh, value of this variable. So last will be Smith's plural. So the text, the value of text will become Mr. Smith's. Okay, so any questions up till now? We're almost now at the coding part. Um, I wanna, before we take our maybe one or two minute break, I would like to just talk about Android Studio. IDE is an integrated development environment. That's what you said. Um, and Android Studio is the primary IDE to develop Android apps. So it combines a lot of really useful tools, such as your text editor, your debugger, and the ability for you to build and compile your app. All of that lives inside of Android Studio. So it's really worthwhile to get to know Android Studio if you want to go deeper in Android, because you'll be spending the majority of your time in this application. I guess if you could do it over again, like start from the beginning and maybe even if like Android and iOS were on par with each other, would you still have chosen to become an Android developer versus an iOS developer? Hmm. Yes, I mean, it's a good question. I think, yeah, I would probably still choose to be an Android developer um, over iOS. I think the, the main attraction for Android is that the number of users that you can reach on Android is so much larger than iOS, right? So someone might have better knowledge than me, but I believe the number of monthly active users of iOS devices is something like 400 million. I mean, so that's a huge number, right? 400 million is nothing to scoff at, but compare that with Android, 
where you have more than 2 billion people who use Android apps or Android phones every single month. And so in terms of being able to reach people, Android is dominant. And also like the job that I have working on Facebook portal is due to my background in Android. So I actually feel very lucky that I picked Android because there are so many opportunities in the world of Android. And I think those will continue growing because if you look at the people who are coming online in the next five years, like predominantly people who are, my, who are maybe more economically disadvantaged or in third world countries, they're primarily going to be using Android. They're not gonna be using iPhone because iPhone is, is too expensive. So I think that there's a lot of potential uh, with Android going forward. What I want to do now is um, actually code an actual application with all of you. If you've done the environment setup, you're happy to follow along. But if you also don't want to follow, like follow along meaning you can try and code the game with me as I'm doing it, I'm going to do it from scratch. Um, if you don't want to do that, that's also totally fine. I'll share the code that I'm writing with you at the end along with the slides. So uh, up to you how you want to take this. But the game that I want to build with you is called memory or concentration, depending on kind of where you're from. Um, I grew up playing it called memory and this is a screenshot of the app. Just, just curious. Um, give me a thumbs up if you have heard of this game or if you've played this game. Okay, cool. So it looks like we have a few thumbs up. Let me, go, let me give a quick background just so we're on the same page. The idea of memory is that you're going to have a bunch of cards that are face down and you want to find pairs of cards that have the same image. Okay. So all the cards start face down and you flip them up two at a time. And if they have the same image, they remain face up. If they're not the same image, you turn them back down again. So the reason the game is called memory or concentration is because you need to have a really good memory about where previous cards that you flipped up were. So when you see them again, you see the other matching pair, you know where to look for the other one. The game ends when you have all the cards face up. Um, and of, of course, the objective is you want to be able to flip all the cards face up in as few turns as possible. Okay, so let me show you, this will make more sense if I actually show you a demo of it. So here's what we're going to build, okay? The, this is how the, what you're looking at here is Android emulator, right? The game starts out with eight cards all face down. And so if I tap on one of these, it's a plane. So now I have no information to go off of because we're just starting the game out, right? But now I can tap on one of these. And actually we got lucky, right? So you can see this message that showed up very briefly at the bottom, which said, you found a match. And because we found a match, these two cards get faded away. They get, um, we reduce the opacity to indicate that they're, they're um, matched. And we can try this again. Okay, so this was not a match, right? So it's a blue heart and it's a green bicycle person. This is not a match. So I'm going to continue the process. I'm going to flip over one card. And you'll notice when I flipped over this next card, the two cards that were flipped over automatically went back to being face down, right? And now the goal is I need to find out where is the red baby. So I know that the red baby is not this card. And it's also not the card in the bottom right because we just flipped those over, right? So I have a one in three chance now of picking out where the baby is. Okay, I got lucky. So I found a match um, and now I have four cards left. So here's the green bike. And then, oh, I forget where is the green bike? It might be this one. Nope, that's wrong. Okay, I think the green bike was down here. So I can pair those up. And now I have two cards left and the two blue hearts. And so now at this point, the game is done. You've won the game um, and all the cards are face up. So that's, that's exactly what we're going to build. Uh, the, like if you really wanted to go deeper, you could have um, you know, a counter to say how many turns it took you to win the game. And also it probably would make sense to have like another button where you can like restart the game. Cause right now the only way to, to start the game over is to actually kill the app like this. And then I'm going to have to go into my apps and then tap on the demo memory game again. And now I'm, I'm able to play again, right? So that's what we're gonna build. Before we get into the coding, what, what questions do you all have about, about this? Do you have a 
a way to transition once all the cards are selected? Do you transition to a new scene or back to the original screen? Like, can you like um, do you do you have something in place yet where you can go back to the the start or just move on yeah. to the next? So right now, yeah, that, I mean, that's, a, that's actually a very natural thing that you would want, right? Some sort of navigation component to say, hey, the game is done, restart the game, or even if the game's not done, let's say you just want to start over, um, you want to be able to press a button and be able to reset. There's no way to do that now. I wanted to keep this pretty simple to avoid any of the complexity or complexities around being able to restart a game or having to go to a different screen, um, just to keep it simple. But yeah, that's something that definitely we could work on um, at the end if we have time. Okay. So yeah, that's actually a good call out though. So every screen on Android is called an activity, okay? So uh, what we're talking about here is an app which has a single activity or a single screen. There's no other navigation components here. That's what you'll, you'll find that as we're building the app, um, there's only really one screen that we're dealing with, okay? So let's, uh, um, let me minimize this and open up Android Studio. Okay, so here is Android Studio. And what I'm going to do is build a brand new Android Studio project. Um, we're gonna pick empty activity, which just means the simplest possible activity. I'm going to call this memory game. The language will be Kotlin. Make sure you pick Kotlin and not Java. And then the minimum SDK I'll leave as a default as 21. Okay, so let me make the font a little bit bigger um, so you can see it. Is that good enough? Is everyone able to see the code clearly? Cool. Um, so the first thing that happened is Android Studio will set up this template project based on the starter project that we picked. We picked empty activity, right? So with empty activity, there are really only two files that were created for us. One is called main activity, and this is a Kotlin file which represents that one screen on the app, the main screen. Um, and this is, this is where we're going to have all the business logic associated with our game. The other important file is activity main. Okay, this file here. And you can see that it's referenced right here. So if I set content view, r.layout.activity main, if I can, I can command click on a Mac, and I think there's a control click, I think on Windows, and that will navigate me to the activity main. Okay, so those are the two files that we're gonna spend all of our time in for this project. If you go to the left part of the screen, there's something here called the project window, okay? And usually what I prefer to do is pick the Android perspective on the project window. And the reason the Android perspective is, is preferable is because this is what, um, as an Android developer, the way I conceptually think about my project and the organization of my files is in the Android view, okay? So I'm not gonna spend too much time in going through all of this just for the sake of brevity, for, for the sake of time. But um, I wanna show you, so mainactivity.colin is going to be inside of the Java package inside of main activity. Um, so I can double click it on the project window and that'll open it up in the editor window, which is this section over here. And then res stands for resources. So anything which is uh, a resource, things like a drawable, a layout um, value. So if I have like a string, that's actually a resource, that'll all be inside of the resources folder. So the one that we talked about, activity main, that lives inside of resources, layout, activity main. I can tap on that and it'll open up the layout. And then I guess one, one other thing, sometimes students get confused because, okay, I made a Kotlin project. I'm writing my code in Kotlin. Why does it show Java over here? And that just is a historical remnant because for most of the history of Android, apps were written in Java, right? Which is why this folder is called Java. But don't get confused. Um, this will contain both your Kotlin and Java source code. Okay, so what I want to do first is build out the UI. Once we have the UI built out, I want to then um, hook up the logic so that we can actually play the game and respond to user tap events. So here's like a quick uh, intro of what we wanna, what I wanna, what you want to learn from this demo. First, we're gonna build a layout. Then I wanna show you how do you respond to user input, which is fundamental to any app. Then I wanna talk about how do you maintain data corresponding to a UI. 
And finally, we'll code up the game logic together. Okay. Um, so the very first thing, going back to the screenshot here, is that each of these buttons is going to have an image or an icon associated with it. Okay, so that's the very first thing I want to do. Is I want to pick these icons. So the way we can do that is I go into resources, go to new, and then go to vector asset. Okay, and this is actually something pretty cool, which is part of Android Studio built in. You can pick clip art as a uh, as an image, as like the source for your image. So what I'll do is I'll tap on clip art and um, you have a bunch of different options here, right? You can see, see it in different categories. I'm looking at all here, which is all the different vector assets that are available to us. Um, and you have a whole lot of options, okay? So I take a look right now. If something catches your eye, shout it out to me and we'll use that as one of the game cards in our memory game, okay? So while you guys are looking at this, just take a quick look, or if you have it open on your computer, tell me what you find very attractive, and we'll pick that. But I know for sure the one that I want to, the default UI, the default image, which is when all cards are face down, I want it to be this image, which is um, an icon for code, because we're coding, right? I thought this could be cute. So I see code, and I'm just going to call it IC code, and I'll leave it as a default color, which is black. So I'll click on Next, and then I'll tap on Finish. Sorry, could you just explain where you got that uh, menu from? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, so we're going to repeat that process four more times because we're going to create eight cards um, and four pairs of cards. So I'll do that four more times, so I'll show you. But before I show it to you one more time, I just wanted to point out when I created that icon, it went into the drawable folder, and now we have iccode.xml. And that represents the, the icon, OK? So yeah, oops. Uh, back to your question, where did that menu come from? What I did is I went into resources, I right clicked, I went into new, and then vector asset. And now I'm going to pick another clip art. Okay, so what do you all think? Did someone uh, find some, something that they found very cute or attractive or funny in this clip art? So I'm going to pick one more, which is going to be a flight. And if anyone does have anything, just let me know. I'm going to call this icon I see plane. And then how about we make this, oops, let's make the color of this be this green color. Okay, so now we have the back, the kind of default background image, and we have one out of four images that are going to be on the cards when they're face up. Okay, so that means we need to make three more. Any thoughts? Go Otherwise, to... I'll keep going with whatever I have. Sorry, someone was saying something? Go with the lightning bolt. Let's do it. So where was that lightning bolt? Thing? I think it's at the top. Or, uh, think... Let's search for it. So, some, so the weird thing about this is that sometimes the naming of these clip art icons is super weird. Let's try lightning. Nope, it's not there. Could it be uh, charge, maybe? Nope. Oh, I lost it. Lightning, lightning, lightning. Aha, here, flash on. So it's like, the names are not very intuitive, but okay, flash on. I'm gonna rename this to be IC lightning. And then I want this to be a different color. So let's make this like, I don't know, blue. All right, so now we're done with two icons. We're gonna make two more. Uh, new vector asset. How about a heart? Everyone, um, this is a very raw human emotion, right? Love. So I want to have one for the heart. Uh, and I see that, let me rename it to be I see heart. Okay, and then now after this, we have one more left. Anyone want to give me one more icon? Do like a, uh, like a smiley face? Yeah, let's try it. How about this guy? Insert emoticon. <laughs> so we'll call it what you called it. You called it a smiley face. So I see smiley, right? Mm -hmm. And then I want to pick it to be a unique color. 
I'm actually forgetting. What color have we not picked yet? I think blue, right? Okay, and then one thing, so now at this point, we're pretty much done with the icons. One way you can validate what these icons look like is go into the resource manager section over here. And so there are a couple here that were automatically provided for us when we picked a starter project. So ignore those. The ones that we introduced were IC Code, IC Heart, Lightning, Plain, and Smiley. And unfortunately, IC Lightning and Smiley have the same blue color, which is actually a mistake. I wanted them to all be unique. So let me um, change the Lightning to be a different color. Uh, vector asset. So flash on is what it's called. I think purple. I'll call this light because it has to be named something different. So I see light. And now that we have I see light, I'm going to go ahead and delete I see lightning. OK, so now all these are different colors, right? So we're not actually doing anything that interesting here. We're just creating these icons so we can use them for our game. Now that we have these, let's actually construct our UI. So I'm going to give ourselves a bit more room here by minimizing the section on the left. And what, <clears throat> what we're looking at here is a design tab for the design section for our layout, OK? So you have an option to toggle here. So what we're looking at now is a design section. If I hover over here, this is a code section. So the important thing to realize about these XML layouts is that, is that there's a relationship between the design tab and the code tab. So I'm going to tap into the code tab. And you can see that there's a constraint layout as the root element. And inside of that, there's a text view. And that text view contains this text called Hello World. But that is how we are seeing this UI. And actually, let me show you one thing that we can do just for kind of sanity checking purposes, is I'm going to click on this. I, did the shortcut for running an app, which is Control R. Um, and so basically, what you can do is you can tap on this green arrow icon. And if you have an emulator running, it'll run whatever app you have on the emulator. OK, so I have this emulator running already, which is where I showed you the demo game. But I'll tap on this green arrow. And now, I guess over here. So do you all see this now? So basically, this is, the, this is me running the app the empty project app. And all it does is show hello world. So that's, that's where the UI is coming from. OK, so for our game, I want to delete the text view. And our game is going to consist of these eight cards, right? Each card will actually be a component called a image button. So I go into this palette over here, and all the different views are categorized by uh, what they are. So you have all these different containers, layouts, widgets, so on. So we're going to drag out an image button. Okay, and the image button, as the name implies, an image button is a button which is an Im which has an image in it, right? And that's exactly what we want for our game. So when you drag it out onto the screen, it'll tell you, it'll ask you, what do you want as a source for this image button? And I'm going to pick IC code because all the cards initially will be face down, right? Meaning that they should have the code icon uh, showing initially. I'll tap on OK. What I'm going to do is hard code the width and height of this image button to be 120 dp. So dp, you can kind of think of it as the same thing as pixels, which is a way to measure how large a widget should be. The reason Android uses dp is because dp stands for density independent pixel. So the reason Android uses dp as opposed to pixels is because there are many different kinds of Android phones, and the pixel density on different phones is different. So for example, if you have a really high-end phone, in, in, one, uh, in the same area on a small phone where you might have one pixel, that higher-end phone might have three pixels, right? And so if you, were, if you were using pixels, then everything would be condensed by a factor of three on this high-end phone, which you don't want, obviously. So instead, you prefer to use DP, which will scale appropriately no matter the phone type. OK, um, the other thing is I want to make the icon here bigger. I want to, I want to take up the full button width and height. The way you can do that is there's a section here or an attribute here called scale type. And I'll set that to be center crop. And that made it bigger. Center crop basically means I want you to take the underlying image and expand it to be as big as possible inside of the button. OK, and I'm going to also change the ID to SP image button 1, because we're going to have image button 1, 2, 3, all the way up to image button 8. OK, so now 
the next thing I'm doing is not super interesting. I'm just going to copy and paste this over seven more times. So we have a, a total of eight buttons. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's image button two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, right? Okay, so that's what our UR looks like. The one of the first things you'll notice here is um here, let me somehow it added these constraints when I copied and pasted it. Let me get rid of that. Okay. The one thing you'll notice is that if you look at the bottom left here on the component tree, there's a red exclamation mark next to each image button. What this is saying is that these views are not constrained. So let me hover over and you can see that. Can you guys see that pop up, which it shows up? It says this view is not constrained. It, it only has design time position. So it will jump to position zero, zero at runtime unless you add constraints. So let me show you what that looks like. If I run the app now, it'll take a second to boot up. Come on. Okay, so here's what the app looks like now. All these eight buttons have been kind of glued to the top left of the screen because of this error, right? We need to, the idea of this root element here called constraint layout is that every position, every view inside the constraint layout should be constrained horizontally and vertically. So that's our job now is we want to constrain each of these um, so that the constraint layout, constraint layout will know where to put it on the screen. So I, I always start with the top left element. And what I usually do is I constrain it to the top end of the screen and the left end of the screen. So the way I did that, let me undo that and just show you. So if you hover over the, the edges, you have this ability to create a constraint. That's what this is called. So I'm gonna create a constraint and attach it to the top end of the screen. And I wanna make this be 24 DP away from the top. And then I wanna do something similar for the left end of the screen. So I'm gonna make this be 48 DP from the left end of the screen. So as soon as I did that now, you can notice the red exclamation mark next to that first image button, image button one, that's gone away. And this is an indication <clears throat> that uh, this view has been properly constrained. So now our job is to do the same thing for all the other seven buttons so that all of these red exclamation marks go away. Um, the way I'll do this is by constraining views relative to the view that we've already constrained. So like one approach you could do is I wanna constrain all these views to be next to the edge with a certain, certain uh, distance, but that'll lead to some negative consequences where if I end up changing the position of this top button, then I have to manually change the position of all the buttons below it, right? So instead, I wanna position this button relative to the one above it. So what I mean by that is I'm gonna select these four image buttons, and now there's an option here where you can align certain parts of it. So what we care about is we wanna align the left edges of these four buttons. So do you see what happened here? So what Android Studio said is, okay, you want to align the left edges of these. So that means that I now know horizontally where to put each of these buttons and they should be aligned to this top one. So now we've constrained each of these four views horizontally. We also need to constrain them vertically. The way we'll do that is by positioning it below the view above it. So I'll just make them 24 DP below the button above it. Okay, so now let's go back to the component tree. So those four buttons that we've changed so far, those all have removed that red exclamation mark, which means that Android Studio or the, the view knows how to lay out these views properly. So we're almost done. We just need to do the same thing now for these buttons on the right side. So the top right button, I'm gonna align the, um, I'm going to align the top edges of these. So you can see again how the button on the right kind of moves to be adjusted to that. And I'm also going to constrain it um, horizontally by making it 48 DP from the right end of the screen. And now for each of these buttons, I want to, each of the buttons on the right side should be similarly aligned to the top button at the top. So I'm gonna select all of these four. I'm going to align the right edges. And then in terms of the vertical positioning, I want the top edges of each of these three buttons to be aligned with the ones, the corresponding button on the left side. So these two buttons should be top aligned, 
these should be top aligned. Top edges should be aligned. And then these two should be top aligned. OK, so one thing you can do just kind of for your own edification is I can go in this I icon and say, show all constraints. So these are all the constraints that we were able to put onto the UI. And you can also see what this looks like programmatically. I'm going to go into now the code tab. And here you can see we have the constraint layout as a root element. And inside of this, we have all these image buttons. We have eight image buttons, one, two, three, all the way up until the eighth one. And here are how the constraints are encoded inside of XML. So there's an XML representation of everything that we just did inside of the design tab. Does that make sense? OK, so I have one question for all of you. Um, this actually works. So let, me, let me run the UI and show you and prove to you that this actually builds the UI properly. OK, I'm going to tap on one of these. You can see, OK, we actually are able to tap. Of course, nothing happens right now when you tap on one of these buttons because we haven't hooked up the logic yet. But we have our UI looking exactly like we want it to. So let me ask you a question now. What is one downside to the approach that we just took? Like, Give me a scenario where what we've built out will break. Maybe if it went to a different screen size? Yes, that's exactly what I had in mind as well. So right now, what we have built here is a UI, which is essentially custom to this phone. And this phone, you can see, is a Pixel 3. However, let's say that I move over. I, I went to this drop down in the UI, and I Let's say I preview how this looks on a tablet, right? So I mean, it looks OK, but not great. Like You definitely want to be able to adapt your screen UI according to the width and height of your screen, right? So this is definitely one of the failures of, of how we've approached this. Um, so let me go back to Pixel 3. Um, and actually, a really easy way of showing this failure is let me rotate the phone, and you'll see what happens. Uh, OK, so yeah, I had to um, turn on screen rotation. But now that the screen is rotated, you can see that there's literally there's no way to see all the buttons now, right? Um, and the reason is kind of logical. We've put a spacing of 24 dp vertically between each button. But when your, screen, when your phone is in landscape mode, as it's shown here, there's simply not enough room to show all these buttons. So uh, this is that's a really good point that, OK, we're not really showing this UI properly. Uh, OK, let me try it again. And <laughs> frankly, I'm not going to worry about that now, OK? I'm just going to kind of punt on this problem because um, I don't want to spend too much time dealing with this. But what, what would be, Zane, you had this idea, right? Like you pointed out the problem. What would be a way to fix it? What do you, what do you think? Maybe set the constraints differently. Yeah, I think I think you're on the on the right on the right track. Basically, I think the way we should be doing this, if we were doing this properly, is honestly this view shouldn't really be constructed by hand um, inside of the design tab. Really, what should happen is programmatically we should be measuring the width and height of the screen, and based on that, we should do some math to lay out these eight buttons on the screen. So we should actually check: is the width longer? Is the width larger than the height of the screen. And if so, that should dictate how we lay out the buttons. So that's actually how we really should be doing it in order to be flexible for tablets, phones in landscape, or um, portrait mode, and other kinds of screen sizes. But for now, I'm not going to really worry about that, um, just because I think that's not super interesting. Any questions so far? OK, so now that we've finished making the layout, all the remaining time that we have is going to be spent in mainactivity.kotlin. And this is where we are going to write the business logic. Just going back to the slides that I have, what we've done so far is built the layout. What I want to talk about next is I want to show you how do we respond to user input. So there's only one way for the user to input, to interact with the app in, in what we have, which is the user taps on a button. right? In, in more complicated or sophisticated apps, you can imagine how you might want to be able to listen for long presses, single taps, um, pinch and zoom. There's a whole bunch of ways a user could input data into an app. 
the only one we care about for our app is when the user taps on something. So when a user taps on one of these buttons, we want to be able to understand where do they tap, right? That's what I want to show you how to do next. So the, the most obvious thing that we need is we need to get access to these eight buttons inside of main activity. The way we can do that is by using the special attribute on each of these views called the ID. So the ID is actually what's listed over here. So that we have eight buttons and the ID for each of these buttons is image button one, two, three, all the way up until eight. So getting access to the view is as simple as typing in the ID name. So I'll say image button one, and you can see that Android Studio helps us with autocomplete. I'll say image button one, and there's a, a method on this object called set on click listener. So that's actually the first suggestion that Android Studio provides to us. And then what you're seeing here are curly braces, okay? And what these curly braces indicate is that when the user taps on this button, the code which is located inside of these curly braces will get, will get executed. This is an example of event-driven programming, right? And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this paradigm. The idea is that you want to take action when the user has done an event. And so the event that we're listening for here is a click on image button one. And what I want to do just to kind of to prove to you that this works is I want to put a log statement here. So the way you do logging on Android is you say log.i, you pass in a tag and you pass in a message. So I'll say button clicked. Okay, and then you have to import this uh, log class. So the way I can do that is with option enter. You can see the Android Studio tells me the hint to import it, so the option enter. And there are a couple options of what you could import. I'll import android.util. Just to demystify that, what that did is it added this line here. Okay, um, so if I um, show you like what is the method signature of this log that I, there are two parameters. The first is a tag, and the second is a message. The tag is a unique identifier for this message. So typically, the pattern with Android development is that the tag should always be the class name. So I'm actually going to define this tag as a variable here, the private const val tag, and it's going to just be the same exact thing as the class name, okay? So now the errors have gone away. All the red underlines have gone away. So now I'm gonna run the app by tapping on this button up here, and it should uh, reboot the app with this new logic. Okay, so now, um, when I tap on this first image button, it is image button one, I should expect to see this log statement. The way you're able to see log statements is by going into this section down here called log cat. So I'll tap on that. I'm gonna bring it up a little bit. So the way logs work is that you have different levels of log, right? I think I talked about this in the video. So what we care about here is info level logs. Log.i means info level. You also have options like log.w or log.e, which means warning and error level. But what we care about is info level. And the first thing I'll notice that is that there's a bunch of logs that are already there, even though we didn't write them. And so that's where the tag comes in. We only care about logs um, that are coming with this tag. So what I'll do is I'll just filter for main activity. Okay, so I'm gonna press enter a few times just so it's clear uh, what's happening. And now I'm gonna tap on this button. So do you see that? At the bottom here, I tapped on the button twice and I um, see this log statement twice. So I keep tapping it and I get more and more log statements. So the thing that you'll notice is that if I tap on any of these other buttons, of course, I'm not getting a log statement because we've only attached this click listener on the first image button, right? So what I really would like to do is I wanna be able to add a click listener on every single button um, on the UI. The way we'll do that is, let me actually zoom out a little bit is I'm going to create a list of all the buttons on the screen. So I'm gonna make this a member variable because we're gonna access this across a few different methods. So I'll say private right in it var is buttons. Does it make sense what I'm doing here? I'm declaring this as an instance variable. The reason I'm declaring this buttons variable outside of the onCreate method is because eventually I'm gonna write a few other methods and we're going to access this variable 
in those other methods. And so in order to be able to access it across multiple methods, I need to have it as a member variable, like defined at the top level of the class. And the type of this, so Kotlin is statically typed, which means that every variable must have a type. We're declaring the type of this variable to be a list of image button. So image button is a thing, is a, is a view that we dragged out onto the UI. So we're making a list of image buttons. And so here is where we're going to declare what is the contents of this list of buttons. And the way we'll do that is by simply adding in the eight different buttons that we've added. So image button one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let me fix these up. Okay, so now we can do something that's quite similar to what we've been doing down here, where we set a click listener, but I wanna do that on every single button, right? I'll say for button in buttons, I'm going to put this stuff up here. Does this make sense what's happening here? So this is a for loop. Hopefully all of you know uh, kind of how that works. What we're doing is we're walking through, we're iterating through this list of buttons and we're saying, I wanna attach a click listener on every button inside of this button list. So now if I run the app, we should see actually very similar behavior, behavior to what we saw earlier. But now on every single button that I tap, I should see a log statement. Did you see that? This, this actually works. I'm not making it up. <laughs> if you actually look behind the scenes, at what is a list, this is actually going to be underneath the hood, uh, like a, an actual Java list or an array list. And the cool thing about Kotlin is that you have any class that's defined in Java, you can use that seamlessly in Kotlin. So behind the scenes, so what happens is Java and Kotlin, when you compile them, they both actually get compiled into something called bytecode. I'm not, maybe some of you might have heard of this term called bytecode. But at the end of the day, really you're gonna be dealing with bytecode and the machine, the Android OS will take bytecode and turn it into machine code and run machine code. So whether you write Kotlin or Java, it'll turn into bytecode and that bytecode will be interpreted in the same way by the machine. So um, that's kind of why you're able to do this interoperability between Kotlin and Java. Okay, so going back to kind of what I wanted to teach you, now we've done responding to user input, right? So now everyone hopefully has, at least in this one very simple example, um, you have an idea now of how do you respond to a button click? That's what we did here. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is when I actually tap on a button, I wanna change something about the UI, right? In particular, what I would like to do is be able to flip the card over. So that right now all of the face down, I'm gonna flip the card over so it reveals the underlying image, right? So. The way we'll do that is we need access to the images that we've defined. Do you remember, do you remember that? Like here are the different images, icy heart, light, plain, and smiley. These are the four different images that we've defined. So we need access to those. I'm going to define that up here. So I'll say val images is equal to a mutable list of image icons. And these image icons are going to be in the resources directory. The way you access resources is with r dot. Okay, so I'll say r.drawable.icheart, right? And so you can see at the left side, the Android Studio gives you a preview of what this looks like. Um, and we're gonna continue this for the other three icons. And one thing we can do actually, just to make it a little shorter, is I'm going to import r.drawable for us. I'm just saying import, here's the package name and import r.drawable.star, which means that we don't have to explicitly import each different um, icon. I can just say I see heart. Okay, and now I'm gonna do the same thing for the other icons that we have. Um, I see, oops, I see light, I see plain, and I see smiley. So now you can see on the left side, the four different icons that we have here. So what we actually want to do is we have eight buttons on the screen and we have four images. So what we really need to do is double up these images. So each heart should be added twice, each light should be added twice and so on. The way we can do this gracefully is images.addAll images. So what this is doing is add each image twice. 
so we can create pairs. Okay, and then one more thing I want to do is the game wouldn't be that interesting if the order of these images was always the same, right? Like right now, the order will be heart, light, plain, smiley, and that same thing repeated twice. And so as soon as you play the game two or three times, it'll become obvious to you where things are located on the board. And so really what I would like to do is I would like to randomize the order. And Colin makes this super nice. There's a method called images.shuffle. That's literally all you have to do. <laughs> like in Java, this would be probably like 20 or 30 lines of code. With uh, Kotlin, it's a single line of code, which is why I love Kotlin so much more. So what this is doing is saying randomize the order of images. Okay, so I have one more question for all of you. I declared this as a val images, uh, right? And uh, let me... Right, so I declare it as the val images, um, and it's a mutable list of these different things. And I, I think, I forget if it was Jessica or I mean, someone earlier had mentioned to me the difference between a val and a var, right? A val is something that, that cannot be mutated. It can't change. Um, but here, I'm actually saying images that add all images. So I'm actually modifying the contents of images, and I'm shuffling the contents of the images. So can someone explain to me how am I able to declare images as a val, but I'm still able to modify it? modify the contents of it. Can someone explain that to me? Because you called it a mutable list. Yes, exactly. Tell me more, William. Tell me more. What do you mean by that? Mutable means changeable. So you've overridden the fact that it's a vowel by saying you can change this vowel. Yes. So, so yes, I think you're very much on the right track. So. What William is saying is that we've declared this as a mutable list, okay? So that, what that means is that the contents of this list can change. And that's why we're allowed to do images that add all. However, we're not actually changing the meaning of val or var. Those still have very precise meanings. But so they mean something... I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so because this is still a val, does that mean you can't change the fact that it's a mutable list, but you can change what's in the list? Almost. Let me show you an example, which I think will demonstrate what, the, what, what this actually means, okay? So the okay. fact that this is a val images means that the images reference, like the list, the reference to the list, that cannot be changed, okay? So here's an example of something that cannot happen. So I declare it as a val. If I say images is equal to a new mutable list of like, you know, uh, one, two, three. So now, do you see how Android Studio is complaining? Val cannot be reassigned. So kind of exactly what William, I think the direction you're going down, that's exactly right. Because val images is a val, it's not mutable. The reference is not mutable. You can't reassign it. However, there's a difference between the reference not being mutable and the contents of this object being mutable. So that's the key difference you want to keep in mind here. This is a mutable list of objects, which means the contents can be changed. And that's what we're doing here. But we're not ever changing the reference. Make sense? So Henry has a question, yes. how did you import the images? The way I'm importing the images, Henry, is by um, adding, adding this line here. And what this is saying is r. So at the end of the day, I should probably explain this a bit more. Any resource actually at the end of the day turns into an integer, OK? That integer is actually a pointer to where this resource lives in memory. So there's some details there that I'm not going to talk about. But basically, um, this. I see heart, if you hover over it, you can see that it's a public static final int. So really at the end of the day, each resource is, a, is an int. And when I say import package name.r.drawable.star, what this is saying is that I'm automatically importing every drawable in this project. And that's how I'm able to do that. Okay, well, the manual way to do it is um, just do r.drawable for each of them. And that should not give you any problem. Okay. Like this. Yeah, because for some reason it wouldn't bring up what I wanted it to. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that too, just so that's easier. So now we're fully qualifying the name of each of these resources. So what I want to do now that we have these images defined here is I want to be able to respond to a user tap and swap out the image resource of that button to be one of the images. So what I want to do is when the user taps, I want to index into images and pull out that image reference. So really what we need here is we need to get the index along with the element. 
Does that make sense to people? So there's, we don't really have access to the index right here, but there is a, a way to do this called for each index. So what we're doing here is we're doing the same exact thing. We're iterating through the list of buttons, but in addition to giving us the actual button, we're also um, pulling out the index. So now I can do the same thing down here. And now I can say button dot set image resource and I'll say images dot index. Okay, let's try it. I'm running the app. So it should come up again. And now when I tap on a button, I expect to see the image resource change. Cool, that looks great. And if, and if we've done our job properly with setting up images here, what we expect to see is that when I turn over all the images, we should see two, exactly two copies of each of these four drawables. Does that make sense to people? Amazing, do you see that? So now we have um, a pair of each of them. Okay, so we've actually implemented a lot of logic already of being able to do the a user turn. Our job now is to implement the game logic. Here's the next thing I wanna do is there's a notion of toggling a card, right? So you flip, flip a card over, you see the underlying image, and then I need to be able to flip it back, right? That's kind of the fundamental part of memory. So right now, if I tap on one of these, we're going in one direction. We're flipping the card over and we're setting the image resource to be the underlying image, but we're not able to flip it back to the code icon. So this is where we need to actually maintain some state. Do people know what I'm talking about when I say maintain some state? So according, like inherent in each memory card in the game, we need to maintain state about whether this card is face up or face down. And if the card is face up, we'll make it face down and switch out the image resource. And if the card is face down, we want to make it face up. Does that make sense to people? Like we need it. This is a, a, a pretty common thing in programming is that you need to associate your UI with some knowledge of what's happening behind the scenes. And that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to create a model which encapsulates that state. Okay, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to define a new Kotlin class called memory card. There's gonna be a data class called memory card. And what this is going to do is capture the idea of what all of the state of a memory card, a memory piece in our game needed to show a UI. So the one that we just talked about is uh, var um, is face up. And then this is going to be a Boolean. Does that make sense? So why is this a var and not a val? Why did I declare this as a variable? Something that is because uh, the variable uh, for boolean is immutable. Uh, because it has to change because the boolean is either true or false. Yes, exactly, exactly. So fundamental to the game of memory is that you're changing the state of these cards is face up or face down. So this these are this is a mutable property, right? A card could be face uh, every card will be face down initially. So is face up is going to be false. When I tap on that card, it becomes face up. So we're changing this property. That's exactly why it's going to be a var. It's going to change. There's one more property that um, I care about for a memory card. Can anyone tell me what that is? So basically what I mean is we obviously care about whether a card is face up or face down. There's one more property about a memory card, which will define how the game works. What is that? It's another Boolean property. Yeah, so the other property I care about is something called is matched, right? So like similar to how we're flipping cards over up and down, like flipping cards, toggling them in the game. We also care about once two pairs, a, a pair of cards, two cards have been matched, we're going to set this property called is matched. And that will also change, right? Because initially none of the cards are matched. And then eventually by the end of the game, every card will be matched. And finally, there's actually going to be, going to be one more property that I care about, which is going to be a unique identifier for this memory card. And that'll be a val because this identifier, oops, identifier string, Actually, this will be an int. So basically what I'm trying to capture with identifier is a unique identifier for this memory card so that when you 
pair up cards. So for example, we have two cards which have lightning on them, right? When those two cards are face up, I want to compare them. And the way we're going to compare them and check if they have the same image is by looking at this identifier field. Okay. So basically, in order to have this notion of being able to toggle a card face up or face down, I want to create an associated memory card for every button on the screen. Does that make sense? So we have eight buttons on the screen. For each of these buttons, I'm going to create a corresponding memory card. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say um, buttons dot for each. Uh, sorry, buttons dot indices dot map. And I'll explain what this means. So I'm creating a brand new memory card here. And the identifier will be the image underlying this button. And that will be uh, indexing into images. I'll say images index. And then is face up and is matched. Initially, when the game starts, both is face up and is matched are going to be false. OK, and you know, one nice thing about data classes in Kotlin, which is what memory card is, is that you can actually assign a default value. So because every single time you construct a memory card, these will always be false, I'm just going to go ahead and set that here, Hit false. So now that we've had these default values, I don't, I don't need to specify them every time. OK, so what, what this line of code is doing, buttons, buttons dot indices. Buttons is dot indices, if I hover over what this is, this returns to us a uh, int range. Do you see that? It's a collection of int range. So basically, if buttons is eight elements long, which is what it is, um, the indices will be 0, 1, 2, 3, up until 7. And what we're saying is that over that integer range, 0 through 7, I want to map, which means on every element of that integer range, I want to um, take that element and operate on it and return something else. And on each of those, I'm on each element, I'm going to create a corresponding memory card. This is what I'm doing here. This is actually creating a new memory card for each of them, for each, uh, for each um, index and buttons. And so this is going to return to us something called cards. OK? And then actually, this cards, I'm again going to reference it in multiple methods. I'm going to define that as a member variable. And this is going to be a list of memory card. So now I don't need to declare it down here. So now what I can do is when the user taps on a button, that is actually changing the state of the underlying memory card, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to grab the card at that index. I'll say val card is equal to cards at that index. And then I'll say cards dot is face up. Or sorry, card dot is face up. And I'm going to switch the value of this. So if the card was face up, I want to make it face down. And if it was down, I want to make it up. And the way you can do that is card dot is face up. Does that make sense to people? So now that we've modified the value of card dot is face up, I can use that to decide what to show on the image, on the button. So I'll say if the card is face up, then I want to set the image resource to be the image that we defined. And otherwise, if the card is face down, I want to return it to the default value, which is that code icon. So I'll say button dot set image resource of r dot drawable dot ic code. OK, let me try this. So if we've done our job correctly, now we should have the ability to toggle between uh, the state of the button. OK, so I tapped on it once. If I tap on it again, you can see that it returned back to the default state. And then similarly, you can do it for all of these. There's a little bit of a lag. Sorry about that. So I'm going to try it again. So I tap on one of these. You can see you can under, I can repeat this process indefinitely. OK, and one other nice thing that you can do is if you look at this if else statement, it's actually quite similar. Like what we're doing in the if and the else block is identical, except for what we're putting inside of the the value of image resource. So there's a nice thing you can do here where I can inline this. So I'll say if hard face up, then I'm going to do this else. OK, so can people kind of take a look at that? 
the line of code that I've highlighted is exactly identical to, to line 38. So I'm going to delete this and then let's try it again. I'm going to run the app again and just make sure that I didn't break anything. Come on. Yeah. All right. So it looks like this is working. What questions do you have right now? Can I help with anything? Okay. So we're almost done. Actually, we have about 15 minutes left, I believe until our workshop ends. I think we can finish this in 15 minutes. So the way that I'm going to implement this program. So let me, let me start. Let me, let me frame where we are. Okay. So right now we built the layout. Everyone has, has done that. We've responded to user input. So we're able to figure out when the user has tapped on a button. And we've now done the third step, which is maintaining data models. Memory card is a data model, which encapsulates all of the knowledge or attributes of a game piece in our memory game. So the final step is I want to show you now how to build out the game logic. And the game logic is where we actually flip over a card. And if we have another card flipped over, we want to check the value, the images on those cards. And if they match, we leave them face up. Does that make sense? Everyone knows where we are and where we're going? Yes. OK, amazing. So the way I'm going to do this is in two steps. So the first thing I'm going to do, whenever a user taps on a card, I'm going to update the underlying models. OK, and I'm going to delegate the work of that to be a, um, a method, which I'm going to call update models. I'm going to have Android Studio help us to create the, this method. OK, after we update the models, I'm then going to update the views. And what I mean by update the views, I want to update the UI that the buttons are showing the proper data. So again, I'm going to delegate that work into another method called update the views. So, so if you look at the work that we've done so far, um, really, this, these two lines of code are updating the model. So we're actually mutating the state of our game. And then this last line of code is the, U, is the UI code or the view code. So I'm going to move these into their respective uh, methods. Actually, this method is going to take in a index. So I'll say position. Um, int. And then update views. Sorry. Um, okay, sorry, I'm getting, okay, so update models is actually referring to this method. So I want to change this. Yeah, okay, that looks better. And then update views is uh, going to um, execute something similar to this line of code, right? So actually, what, what we're doing right now is we're updating that single button, but in reality, when we're actually implementing the game, when I make a change, the UI for not only that button may change, but also other buttons on the screen might change. In particular, if you go back to thinking about um, how we had done the demo of the game, if I have two cards which are face up, which are not matched, in the next card that I flip over, those two cards that were face up, those should now go face down. So when I write this method, update views, I no longer want it to just operate on a single button. I want to iterate through the whole set of models in, in my game and make sure all the buttons are properly set in the UI. Does that make sense to people? So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to iterate through all the cards. So I'll say for card in cards, if the card is um, for every card in our game, I want to get the corresponding button. And on that button, I want to set the image resource according to whether this card is face up or face down. And so in order to get the corresponding button, I need to get the index. I'm going to do something similar to what we've done before. I'll say cards for each indexed. Right? And now I'll say val button is equal to buttons at that index.
And if the card is face up, then the underlying image will be the identifier of that card, the card dot identifier. And then otherwise it'll be code, okay? So what I've done here is done some refactoring essentially, but I haven't done anything different in terms of the functionality of the, of the program. So let me prove that to you by running the app. So I can go ahead and if I tap once on any of these, then I, I get to see the image and I can toggle back, back and forth, right? Okay, so that's all I've done. So now is the actual interesting part of the game, right? So this update views method is pretty much done. We're not gonna really modify it. Um, really what we need to do now is in update models. So right, so right now, for example, here, I up flipped over two cards. When I flip over one more card, as soon as I flip that card over, these other two cards should have then become face down. So that is a logic I want to encode in update models. There are going to be three cases here. The first case is prior to me tapping on this button, there were zero cards previously flipped over. Second case is there was one card previously flipped over. And in the last case is there were two cards previously flipped over. Is everyone convinced that, that these three cases is the, is the totality of what is possible? There is literally no other possibility because you can either have zero cards previously flipped over, one card previously flipped over, or two cards. There's no possible way. Like, let me show you. Like what we have right now, these three cards flipped over, that should never ever happen in an actual game of memory. So is, is everyone convinced that these three cases will properly capture um, our gameplay? Yes. Because once, once you have this knowledge, now it should be, once we have this common assumption or common uh, proof, then now it should, it'll be really easy to actually build out the game logic, okay? So what I wanna do now is just talk about what should happen in each of these cases. If there were zero cards previously, previously flipped over, actually, it's very easy. All we want to do is flip over that card, right? Flip over the card that was selected. If there was one card flipped over, this is the interesting part, right? If there was one card flipped over, we're flipping over a second one, this is where we want to flip over the selected card, right? And we also want to check now if the images for each of these two cards that we have now are the same. Let me zoom out a bit. And finally, if there were two cards previously previously flipped over, that means that these two cards did not didn't match, right? And we need to first reset these two cards and flip over the one that we have. So I'll say first we should restore the cards and then flip over the selected card. So if you understand this, everything else is actually very, very simple. So what questions do you have about what I just wrote? Okay, so now that we have understanding of this, um, one thing I'll, I'll point out is that cases for zero cards previously flipped over and two cards flipped over, these are identical. And the reason is because I can just copy over this line, restore cards. So whether there were zero cards flipped over or two cards flipped over, I'm going to just call, I'm gonna first, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna restore all cards to be face down. And then I'm gonna flip over the selected card. So now, instead of having three cases we have to deal with, we only have to deal with two cases. Does that make sense? The other thing I wanna point out is that this, this section here, flip over the selected card, that happens no matter what. If a user taps on a card and it's a valid move, we should flip that card over. So that's, so given that this happens, flip over a selected card, that action happens no matter what, I'm going to move that out of the conditional logic and have that happen unconditionally. Does that make sense? And actually one thing I just noticed is that this um, spelling of this is incorrect, position. Okay, cool. And actually one thing also I wanna do is some error checking, right? So if the card, If the card is matched, then that means the card should already be face up. If the card is matched though, um, the user should not be able to tap on it. Actually, if the card is face up, 
So if the card is already face up, that's not a valid move to be able to flip a card back down. So I'm just going to show a message saying toast um, invalid move. And then we can return early. So toast is like an Android concept for just showing a very brief message at the bottom. So what we're saying here is I want to show this message invalid move for a short amount of time. Um, and you might have seen this when we created a match. You, we, I showed this message very briefly. So that's what I'm doing here. OK, so now we have three cases, right? And I've shown you how this case and this case are exactly identical, right? So the only one we have to worry about is whether there was one card flipped over previously or there were zero or two. The way I'm going to distinguish between these two cases is by introducing one more member variable called private uh, var index of single selected card. This is going to be an int, which will initially be null. So note that this is going to be an optional int, right? That's what this question mark means. So it's a nullable int. So initially, there is no card selected on the board, which means that this is going to be null. That's why I declared this to have an initial null value. Okay. So what I'm going to do is if, let me put this below the comments. If the index of a single select card is null, what does that mean? That means that we are either in the first case or the third case, right? So that means that there were zero or two selected cards. So if, in this case, um, we want to flip the card over, and that's already happening down here. And the other thing we want to do is at the end of this turn, there is now a single selected card. So I can just say index of that selected card is going to be the position. In the other case, this means that there was exactly one card. One card was selected previously. Right? And in this case, this is where we want to actually do the matching logic, right? So I'll say check for match. And then I'm going to set the index of the selected card to be null. Because at the end of this turn, either there was a match, in which case um, the index of the selected card is null, or there was not a match, we should turn those cards over. But again, the index of the selected card is null. There is no single selected card at that point. So let me define this method. OK, so this check for match actually should take in two parameters, one which is the index of the single selected card, and the other which is the position. So this is like um, position one and position two. So the job here is we have these two cards on the board. We want to check if these two cards have the same underlying image, right? And the reason Android, Android Studio is complaining is because technically index of selected card is a nullable property. So, but we know because we've checked it right here that it can't be null. So I'm going to just force Android Studio to stop complaining about this by putting in double exclamation mark. And if you're coming from a background in Swift, this actually might look somewhat familiar. OK, but we have like a few minutes left. We're almost done, though. Someone help me out. How do I implement this method? How, how can I check if the cards at these positions are the same? So we have this member variable, right, called cards. And this cards contains what is the underlying image. So that's exactly what we're going to use here. So I say cards at position one. If the identifier of that is exactly equal to the identifier at position two. Then we can set the is matched property to be true because we've actually identified a match, right? And we'll tell the user match found. Um, and that's it. So at this point, we are pretty much done. Let's try it out. I'm going to run the app. Oh, actually, sorry. One thing that we didn't do is in the case for the zero or two cards flipped, the first thing we want to do is actually restore all the cards. So I'm going to write that here, restore cards. I'm going to define that as a method. So all, all we're going to do here is iterate through all the cards. 
And if the card is not matched, right, then I want to flip it to be the default, which is is face up is false. Okay, let's try it now. Okay, so I flipped over one card. I'm going to pick one more. Um, these didn't match, okay? And so if I try tapping on a face-up card, I get this pop-up, this toast message saying invalid move. So here's the true test of our, logic, of our game logic. If I tap on one more element, I should be, uh, these two, bo both these cards should be flipped over back to the default state. And there you can see it did. Cool, so it looks like it's actually working. So let's, let's actually play the game and see if this works. So I have purple lightning here and a heart, an uh, airplane. Um, I don't know if we saw an airplane before. Okay, that didn't work. Uh, a blue smiley face. I think that was here. Nope. <laughs> I'm not doing very well. Okay, there we go. We have a match found. Um, heart, there it is. And there. Okay, so the, the actually it's working. The only last thing I want to show you and then we'll be done is um, here. If the button, if the card is matched at this point, And I want to actually reduce the opacity to be much lighter so that it's obvious that, you know, this card has been selected. And the way you can do that is by saying 0.1F, which is saying I'm on 10% opacity. So now that should be the whole game. Let's just play it one more time and then we'll be done. Okay, wow, I got lucky. I got an airplane match on the first move. Um, all right, these didn't match. And those match, and you can see that it is getting faded out properly now. There. I think we finished the game. Okay, so I know we're a few minutes over, so I will send out all the content uh, that we talked about, the slides and the code. I'll send it to Ian, and we can figure out how to get it to you.